So we've heard quite a bit today about the, the benefits of using erasure coding potentially over RAID. What's the disadvantages of using erasure coding? Where's the, are there any potential downsides that you've got to look at? Um, I don't believe to. So, I mean, you can look at erasure coding as software RAID. So the only difference is we're doing it over chassis. So it gives you the advantage of not only being able to lose a disk in RAID or a couple of disks, you can actually lose complete storage nodes, complete chassis, and contain, you know, remain to have access to your data. And your data rebuild times are very, very fast. So an object store um, can recover a four terabyte disk much faster than the additional hardware RAID could ever do. Because every node in the storage node in the storage cluster can participate in rebuilding um, the missing parity bits or the missing data. So it's very, very quick. Um, so I think there's a lot of advantages associated. Just on that kind of topic, though, isn't there necessarily potentially a requirement for both? Because erasure coding is typically spread across multiple data centers if you build out a global namespace across multiple locations. And therefore, rebuilds across data centers is actually relatively slow because you've got the WAN links involved in between. So therefore, having a combination of local RAID potentially for data that you don't want to have to have that rebuild happen is maybe a good way of delivering that, as well as erasure coding. I'm not saying that you know there are cases for both, I believe. so. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Um, I think there's places for both, right? Um, the biggest challenge I see on the market is disks are getting bigger. If you talk about RAID with big disks, 10 terabyte helium drives, how long does it take to do a RAID rebuild? Question mark, right? A long time. With erosion coding, you get over that. I agree, Grant, certainly for distributed, there's challenges around certain things like WAN links, but then you could say that about the cloud. So for me, it's one of those things of finding the best solution for the best fit in terms of data durability and things like that. There's a, a very good white paper, sort of, sort of plug HGST again that we have, that talks exactly of the benefits of erasure coding versus RAID. And I'll get Ryan or Davide at the back to, uh, to send you some links. Okay. Um, a thought just occurred to me that RAID versus erasure coding is heading towards erasure coding coding because disk rebuilds take so long. What happens if we have SSDs instead? So I imagine a RAID rebuild of an SSD will be a darn sight quicker than a RAID building rebuild of a disk. Does RAID rebuilding take more or less processing time than in erasure coding? And would that be the deciding factor when we're looking at rebuilding failed SSDs? Um, I honestly don't know. I'm going to be brutally honest, I don't know. Um, that's a question, Chris, actually, I probably could give to engineering, and they would probably give me a very, very good stock answer about rebuild times. What I'm excited about, though, is I do think erasure coding is going to make it to SSDs, and I think you've picked that up already. High-performance erasure coding is definitely one of the other options. Um, and latency, a lot of people mentioned about latency today, and that's one of the things that I think is a challenge for object storage in certain environments. So um, again, it's one of those stock answers is it depends, um, but there is certain engineering thoughts about flash or SSD or PCIe versus, well, you name it, there's been things around that. Um, yeah, I'll take the, that question or we, you can, or you, you can both. We can both a little bit to it. Yeah, so. yeah, so, yeah. So what I'll add to it is if you have a cluster, and I'll talk about this in the Keringo sense, um, but if you have a cluster, um, <laughs> sorry, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with, let's say you've got 100 storage nodes in it and um, you lose a disk in one storage node. Now, with RAID, all the rebuild, um, with hardware RAID anyway, all the rebuild resources go onto that one node, onto that one RAID controller. With the likes of Kringo, when you lose a disk, be SSD or normal, 100 storage nodes come into rebuilding it. So you don't have one um, controller or one node which is overloaded because you've got a hundred sharing the load which means that your data access time while the rebuild is happening is very little difference to when the data is available. So I have a different question and it's not about erasure coding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about OpenStack actually. I, I, I want to, to, to understand better the relationship between OpenStack and containers now because uh, wow! Uh, yeah, no, no. It, it's <laughs> so from question. my point of view. Now we uh, we are 
talking a lot about Kubernetes and other uh, container right. orchestration, whatever tools. And so. Okay, so um, I got my personal opinion, of course. Um, so from a certain perspective, there is a project, of course, on the OpenStack that is managing containers uh, and leverage um, either, at the moment, either Kubernetes or Docker Swarm as a backend for handling. Uh, the problem we have with containers in general, aside from, uh, from OpenStack, is dealing with uh, multi-tenancy. So the way is, well, it's not the only problem, but it's, uh, let's, say, let's say one of the problems is multi-tenancy. So in OpenStack, what this does is that you, when you request for a container, it is actually build your own, um, uh, your own dockerized environment using Kubernetes or Swarm, or probably Mar um, Marathon uh, and uh, Mesos, for example, I hope so soon. Um, and then delivers the application for you inside your own tenant. This is the way it's done. I'm honestly, I'm not that happy with the implementation. So I would, uh, I think it's a bit nasty of you know, doing one of the things, but it's the start of the, uh, at the end of the day. Um, the good thing about OpenStack is having a standardized API. Uh, and so I would expect uh, something better in the future. So it's just a problem of maturity, it's not a... a no, I mean, uh, I, um, if you have a list of OpenStack projects, it's a huge list, okay? Mm -hmm. There's some more mature and some less mature. I would say Manium is, which is the, 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 the project of our, around containers, is in a bit in an early stage, I guess. Mm -hmm. I know DreamHost is really working on that, okay? But um, I believe there's some way to go still. Okay. Um, what? Back to, and uh, I got questions about, uh, if I may go back to mm -hmm. the topics around erasure coding and uh, actually one access. is one of the problem, well, one of the problem when you architect multi data center architecture with OpenStack is about one latency. So uh, if you think about, uh, uh, what is the question? Oh, okay. Um, uh, if you think about uh, uh, data integrity, you don't really care, an object store, you don't really care how much time does it take to replicate? The most important thing is that it replicates, okay? Uh, and that's on a sync based. Uh, it's if uh, on a sync base, okay, we're doing sync replication with Seth, for example, but it has to be within milliseconds of distance. And back to erasure coding, uh, the way I've seen Seth is more about not wasting raw terabytes. Because with, uh, with Seth, you have Replica 3 as a mandatory access. Uh, to, to build a cluster. So you actually need to buy three times the storage you actually need. So you're gonna have the same amount, of, well, uh, less raw storage if compared to the, uh, what actually you can use. Enrica, I'd just like to pick up on your OpenStack comment about one of the issues with OpenStack and containers, OpenStack versus containers, is they are both of them are really early technologies. And even though containers is a pretty understood and pretty well-defined thing, what you can use them for is absolutely anything. And one of the things you can use OpenStack for is pretty much absolutely everything. Because it's an open source, unfunded, anyone can jump on OpenStack, how many different projects are there? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy the amount of projects. And the thing is, is you can choose your level of inception because you can run OpenStack inside a container, yet you can run containers that are managed by OpenStack. You can run uh, you know, Swarm managing Kubernetes, Kubernetes managing Swarm. All of this sort of interaction is crazily complicated. Uh, in a way, there aren't any standards, which is a bad thing, but it's also a good thing because in years to come, the market will decide and the market will work out whether what's the best orchestrator. Is it going to be um, OpenStack at an IaaS layer? Is it going to be uh, Kubernetes, DCOS, Mesos, those kind of things on that kind of level? It's going to take time. And I think people are also going to wait because they're going to choose the implementations that work for them for now, but with the expectation that things are going to change. Because they will do, because this is all brand new. And uh, on that, I think that there's a dark horse, and that's Windows Server 2016 with yeah. container support. Well, that's we, part of the container story. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and I think you know, that's a whole different they're gonna arrive at that third platform from the second platform that way. They're gonna come from their Microsoft practice and you know they have an app model that works with containers and they can do it on 
Windows Server 2016 or you know, maybe with what VMware are doing with Photon OS, you might see it kind of mainstream itself. It's, it, it, but to your point, it, we got to let it play. But I think Microsoft's is interesting that for the very first time when that comes out, uh, Mesos and uh, Mesos and Docker are both going to support Linux and Windows containers. And you think, how crazy is that? That's never happened. These two arch enemies that have been at each other's throats forever. And now there's going to be actually a common operating model that you're going to spin up a Docker container and how much you, you're going to spin things up in Azure on .NET on a Windows 2016 uh, server for some workloads and then other Docker ones on Red Hat or Ubuntu in um, AWS, even Ubuntu on uh, Amazon, wherever you want, but the same management layer. That's what's going to be powerful, the same management layer. And that's actually, to, so the real, uh, I believe that the real powerful thing about Docker is not everybody think about Docker as a virtualization, sort of virtualization platform, but I see it as a way of distributing application rather than actually, it's a sort of next level package manager. Yeah, and I think that's, that's an important point to make because because you can put anything in a Docker container, people also think it can do everything. Yeah. When it can, but it shouldn't be used for everything. Because I, and I can, well, say 2016, if you can, Windows 2016 on a Windows example, you could probably, do, you would be able to Dockerize Exchange. But would that be a bright idea to Docker, Dockerize Exchange or SQL Server? You know, what's the benefit of that? Just because you can, doesn't mean you shouldn't. And now those are the questions that companies and people are gonna work through. Uh, I mean, uh, we talk a lot in the community around OpenStack, but we have here a storage, backup, consultancy services. How much are you talking with customers around OpenStack? I mean, they are looking to adopt OpenStack, or is it just on the communities? Well, I, can, I, can, I can talk from a hardware perspective. So we're very lucky. We have some JBOD technology at HGST. And people are looking at deploying JBOD technology because of costs with OpenStack and Ceph. They're the most common ones. And it's all about that deployment thing, yeah? I want to leverage some of the best of breed technology, but I still want to use my software defined. And I like both. I don't really care from that side. I think the other thing that's interesting is the products are maturing, right? Tiering inside Ceph and things like this are bringing opportunities for our hardware play to come in. We can put SSDs in there. We can put you know, high-density disk drives in there. We're talking about tuning enclosures in the future. So there's a lot of exciting things in terms of hardware that can complement the, the open software model. If I look at it from a consultancy side of things, um, talking to enterprises, not that much. Um, then it's a community thing, like you said. But if you take it overall and look at it from, uh, from a high point and, and see what the capabilities are of all these things, in the next couple of years, companies will certainly do more and more with OpenStack and Docker and everything. Do you Absolutely. Think about the movement of Intel and Volkswagen that they are moving out of VMware to OpenStack can be... It's not the, the only one in automotive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. I can't disclose names, but I'm not the only one. So um, I... I mean, um, it's public now. Um, they yeah, it's... Big companies start to hear about... I mean, huge I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to discuss any name at all. Probably, uh, compared to, uh, to my colleague, it's, I'm lucky, okay? <laughs> I would say one of the two companies, one of each two company, big companies are uh, thinking about OpenStack. And I would say I'm really, really, really large companies are moving to OpenStack. Uh, at least, I would, as I said, I, I, I told, talk about bimodal IT, dual mode IT. Uh, somebody doesn't like it, okay. Uh, but uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, um, they will have to cope with both. And uh, they're trying to, you know, trying to slowly go to OpenStack as a way of introducing into the IT. So probably you don't see in production now, but certainly one of the two companies, one every two or five companies are slowly try, trying to introduce OpenStack in, uh, in their own companies. Yeah, we do a lot with universities, with OpenStack and Ceph. It seems to be one of the areas, the verticals that we, we do. Media and entertainment, believe it or not, is looking at it exceptionally. It's really exciting, right? Because there's lots of new stuff coming out and people want to try new stuff. But certainly I see in life sciences, media and entertainment, Less in oil and gas, probably, but certainly education establishments uh, throughout right. Europe. 
Yeah. See, uh, pretty, pretty much, oh, there it is. <laughs> pretty much every industry, yeah. I would say. No one is exempt. Uh, for example, I mean, um, I cannot talk about the other c customer, but I would say on the, on the Volkswagen uh, perspective, for, for example, I'm, I, I think they're building their own infotainment stuff, for example, and this is a way of building software. That's another way of uh, embracing OpenStack. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean uh, creating or you know, doing standard IT stuff, but also, for example, for, for building application or building appliances. Because you can, again, with automation, you can create a QA environment, create a build environment, then destroy it, reuse it, destroy it, and that's the way. It's not this easy an easy path with another. So, but then again, what technology. what is the big driver behind um, going to OpenStack? And I understand if you're a very big company with a lot of developers, um, it's easy to do that. It's easy to go and 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 get OpenStack and and start with it and build from there and maybe even like Intel or Volkswagen do a, a, a big turnover to mm -hmm. OpenStack. But a lot of companies are still figuring out how they will do that kind of thing. And it will take a couple of years before they really want to drive 100 kilometers per hour into OpenStack, right? Uh, I mean, I have different opinions, let's say this way. Uh, of course, it, it really depends in which kind of uh, targets you're going to, to end up, you know? Mm -hmm. If you end up uh, on uh, small and medium customers, uh, that I probably tend to agree with you. Mm -hmm. That would be very easy, and probably OpenStack is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, because the entry point of OpenStack is really high. I mean, just to have um, a standard production environment, you can talk about really production is about twenty nodes. Mm -hmm. So it's not really for everybody. Yep. But, uh, so don't you see a space for these uh, new startups building uh, OpenStack as a service? Absolutely. Or, absolutely. No, yeah. not, not, yeah. only, not only IBM with Blue Box, but uh, also ZeroStack and uh, well, look Platform, at Platform 9. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we, I tried uh, just to connect back to, um, uh, to the containerized world because you mentioned it. Uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, with my team uh, and my colleague, we're trying to uh, do an hyperconvergence version of, uh, of OpenStack, and we managed to squeeze everything on three nodes. Well, three nodes is the bare minimum for having an arbiter and uh, handling the failover. So using methodologies like Colla, which is a project of OpenStack, of running OpenStack inside a container, which sounds crazy, but if you see it from a, a, a service distributor, as a package manager, mm -hmm. it, it makes sense because as a fucking sorry, of requisites, so it's easy to deploy. You said we should wild up. I certainly need to go to bed. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I work. Um, I work in an enterprise as a as a customer and on the financial side. And from the OpenStack thing, I don't see any any need at this stage. Um, I think give it a few years, even five-ish or so years, when people are, don't want to be spending money against VMware, maybe, and OpenStack uh, improves, maybe. But definitely from the container side on, just from the package management point of view, um, enterprises are sick of even, you know, we went from physical machines, they, they're sick of the deployment now, time now to even get uh, virtual machines up and running. And so, yeah, they're all keen on containers, just so developers don't have to deal with a grubby infrastructure lot. Yeah, I mean, you're not locked there. Oh, sorry, guys. You're not locked about oh, doing container on the OpenStack. You can do on traditional yeah. work. Yeah, yeah anyway. absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, <laughs> around uh, containers, that we have the message. Uh, around container better virtualized. Uh, what do you think about container running on bare metal and virtual platform? Really, you need a hypervisor to run containers, or you can come back again and deploy bare metal provisioning? To be honest, technically it doesn't matter, but it's actually far simpler to run containers in virtual machines because unless you rarely at scale that you're going to dedicate a cluster of 100 physical machines just to, run, uh, just to run containers. Containers at the moment don't have a great security model. That's going to evolve even with uh, Ubuntu's LXC is going to be uh, you know, much better than just the, na the native containers. At the moment, I think it's just going to be far simpler to have the flexibility that you can run both, but yeah, in, in, in the future, who knows? I think people get too 
bogged down and too, um, too excited about whether it should be bare metal or virtual machines. Me, I think at the moment, to uh, an even mix between the two for most companies, yeah, just run them in virtual machines. It allows you to expand and contract the size of your virtual machine bubble and then your container bubbles inside, but uh, it, really, it really doesn't matter. Anybody else think. remember having this argument about running applications on bare metal or virtual machines? Well, yeah. <coughs> 10 years ago? Yeah. Same guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so I have a different question. With okay. virtualization, containers, but these have all been done before. Which old technology is now going to become hot? <laughs> <laughs> Cobol. <clears throat> okay. You're going quiet, I don't know. Thing. Uh, Flash. So, so, Chris, what do you reckon? Which mainframe technology is going to come again? Um, what was that for you? Will it come to that? Um, I think it's the Kicks come back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kicks. Kicks and SNA? Yeah. Let's go back to SNA and X25. So, okay. so, the JCL in there just to add a little bit of flavor. Oh, yeah. Here, here's one for you. You know how the mainframe had a Linux partition? What do you think about a, like, kind of the other way around of a mainstream OS having an OpenStack partition? Already dying. Which is what Windows is doing. So I think it's kind of happening. So I think that kind of, you know, at the processor level, they were two totally different worlds, but they, they put in that other partition. I think, that's, I think Microsoft did that in the best mainstream example with their container support. Well, I've got one for you as well. Thinking of uh, stored procedures on SQL servers, everyone wrote these massive stored procedures, which were basically Excel macros in a stored procedure. AWS Lambda is the reinvention of stored procedures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. oh.